San Antonio starts right now. Hi there. Good morning. It is Friday, March 31st. Happy Friday. We hope you had a wonderful week and outside right now, a little humid. A lot humid. Let's go out there right now. See how things are looking out there. Peaks of sun here or there. Also some clouds. Justin Horn joins us. So the humidity you're talking about is going to do sort of a yo-yo thing where uh, we lose the humidity, it comes back, and then goes away again. So expect a lot of changes really throughout the forecast. We've got a lot to look at. Yesterday was humid and warm. We made it up to 79. Today will be different in the sense that we have humidity early, but by the afternoon things dry out a little bit. 91. The forecast side today. Yes, 91. Remember when we were in the 60s earlier this week? Uh, yeah, it is March, uh, and uh, we tend to see those variable temperatures. Uh, there's like the satellite picture right now. We've got a lot of cloud cover, at least at the moment. Those clouds will break up and start to go away as we head towards uh, the midday, and then by the afternoon, you will see plenty of sun. 71, we're already off to a warm start. 71 in the Braunfels. Upper 60s for Kerrville and Rock Springs and Del Rio, where skies are already beginning to clear. And around San Antonio, right around 70 degrees at this hour. Our case had 12 hour forecast, mostly cloudy early and then partly cloudy by 1 o'clock, 88 at 3 o'clock, 90 by 4 p.m. And there it is, 91, mostly sunny at 5 p.m. If you have evening plans for your Friday, it looks pretty good, although it will be somewhat warm, maybe a little bit breezy from time to time. And we've got to mention this, pollen count came in, and oak is in the very high category, 12,680, the highest number so far this season. So we're still climbing. Everything else is in the low category. On Friday, the morning commute is supposed to be nice and easy. Stephen, is that how it played out this morning? Oh, Justin, it was great. You know, way, <laughs> great way to start the weekend. We had some relief on the roads and, you know, those 60s really do feel like a distant memory. But uh, let's talk about what's happening at this moment on the roads because you can see, part of me, uh, things are moving along at 35 at US 90, which tends to be a pretty big problem spot during morning rush hour. But uh, we were looking at the map earlier and was quite surprised not to see a lot of red out there. Now, while these transguide cameras are showing smooth sailings, for a lot of these drivers. Unfortunately, it looks like we do at least have one pretty big issue right here along 35 South and at Judson Road. Check out that ugly color of red out there. That is congestion that is building up due to a crash that's been reported in the area. Uh, right now, it's being reported as a major crash, but it doesn't appear uh, that we are seeing any big shots at Transgard where we're seeing a lot of flashing lights, but we are seeing a lot of that backup. So let's hope everyone's doing okay out there. If you're traveling through the area, make sure to move over or slow down. Otherwise, just find an alternative route. Let's give you now a wide look at the metro Metropolitan area, plenty of green out there. As I mentioned, it was a pretty uh, nice morning as we got the commute rolling throughout morning rush, but we're going to watch these roads closely. 37 at Southeast Military looks pretty quiet as well, even 35 at St. Mary's, but we'll keep a very close eye on what's happening over on the northeast side at 35 at Judson. I'm starting to see that we may have a shot here from Transguide. There it is. You can at least see one first responder out there on the scene. Uh, obviously, there may be a little bit more, but we'll watch this area closely and hopefully have a better update to report later on, guys. Stephen, thank you. Latest now on some big stories we've been tracking. Pope Francis is expected to return home from the hospital tomorrow. Vatican says the 80 year old, 82 year old pontiff rather, will also be able to participate in the Palm Sunday service at St. Peter's Square. Pope Francis has been in the hospital for a respiratory infection since Wednesday. And new developments in the train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio last month. The Justice Department has filed a lawsuit seeking damages from Norfolk Southern for the pollutants that were said to have been discharged into the water after the incident. We'll continue to monitor that story at well. And here's today's Nine at Nine. After yesterday's historic indictment of former President Donald Trump, the Manhattan DA's office says it has been in talks with Trump's legal team about coming to New York and surrendering. Sources say that could happen as early as next week. It's all stemming from an investigation involving alleged hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election. Donald Trump had told his supporters to protest if he was indicted. So this morning, NYPD officers were told to show up in uniform beginning at 7 a.m., ready to be deployed around the city. Police will be on high alert on the heels of Trump's indictment. And while officials say there are no credible concerns right now, the biggest concern is next week. As funeral services begin for the victims of the Nashville school shooting, the Biden White House and Democratic lawmakers are pushing for gun safety legislation in Washington, D.C., but they face an uphill battle. Many Republicans are not interested in taking steps in that direction, saying going after guns isn't the way to address mass shootings. 
New details are emerging as to what may have motivated the 2017 attack on a music festival in Las Vegas from a Mandalay Bay hotel room. Sources say the shooter was upset about how casinos treated him as a high roller. Casinos used to treat such gamblers to luxury rewards, but changed those policies a few years before the shooting. The shooter is said to have had two to three million dollars he used to gamble on a regular basis. Mexico's government says it will compensate the families of the victims of the deadly fire at a migrant detention center. 39 people died and dozens more were injured after authorities say a group of migrants started a fire in their holding cell in protest. Mexican government officials say the migrants were behind a locked door and that none of the employees made any attempt to rescue them. Authorities are investigating the fire as a homicide. They've identified at least eight people so far who could be held responsible. Bed Bath & Beyond is trying to avoid bankruptcy by planning to raise money from sales of up to $300 million worth of stock. The retailer sold stock back in February to help fund operations. The company is also trying to cut costs by closing more than half of its stores. The average long-term U.S. mortgage rate dipped to a six-week low this week. Freddie Mac reported that the average benchmark 30-year rate fell to 6.32%, down from 6.42% last week. More good news, the National Association of Realtors reports home prices fell one-fifth of one percent from February last year to $363,000, the first annual decline in 13 years. Used car prices are surging again after falling 14 percent from last year's average of more than $31,000. Prices are climbing as supply fails to keep up with rising demand. The number of workers filing for unemployment benefits was up last week, but still is historically low, a sign the labor market remains robust despite high-profile layoffs at large companies. And that's today's Nine at Nine. Going back to the big story everyone is talking about today, the historic indictment of Donald Trump, the first time a former or a sitting U.S. president has ever faced criminal charges. We are learning more about the seriousness of the potential charges and the political fallout this morning. ABC's Morgan Norwood is in New York with the latest. This indictment certainly unprecedented, but the big question this morning, when will former President Trump turn himself in? Sources close to this say we could see that as early as next week. This morning, the news of Donald Trump's indictment reverberating around the globe. Trump now the first president, former or current, to face criminal charges. A Manhattan grand jury handing up an indictment and a years-long investigation involving alleged $130,000 hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election. Shortly after word of the indictment, Trump talking with our executive editorial producer, John Santucci, claiming the action was political persecution. Trump, who's currently a candidate for the 2024 Republican nomination, going on to say they're trying to impact an election. But no one knows what evidence the grand jurors have been sent or what charges Trump is facing because the indictment is under seal until he is arraigned. But we do know the grand jury has heard from Trump's former fixer and attorney Michael Cohen, who testified before the jury telling them he wrote a check to Daniels at Trump's direction. Cohen pled guilty and served prison time for his part of that payment. Jurors have also heard from Bob Costello, who says he once advised Cohen and has taken the stand in defense of Trump. Michael Cohn is far from solid evidence. Trump has long denied any wrongdoing. His legal team says he only paid Daniels to protect his family from extortion. His lawyers now vowing to fight the indictment. This as several Republicans rallied to his defense, including House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, claiming the Manhattan DA weaponized our sacred system of justice against President Donald Trump. According to sources close to the matter, the Manhattan DA's office is also investigating a second alleged Trump payment to former Playboy model Kieran McDougal. There are also other federal and state criminal investigations into Trump underway. But as for this case, we're pretty sure that at the heart of this charge is filing false business records with an intent to defraud. That's a misdemeanor, a state charge that's typically a misdemeanor, but that can become a felony if it's done in furtherance of another crime. And all NYPD officers were told to show up this morning at 7 in uniform, ready to be deployed across the city. Those heightened security measures will be in place for weeks and even at Trump Tower. Morgan Norwood, ABC News, New York. In your other morning headlines, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and his top lieutenants are preparing to move a bill to raise the national debt limit. The party line bill would avoid the nation's first ever default. 
President Biden has called on the House GOP to raise the $31.4 trillion debt ceiling without any conditions or strings attached to avoid the prospects of fiscal calamity. Congressman Garrett Graves from Louisiana says that's the one thing they are not going to do. Today marks 28 years since the Queen of Tejano died after she was shot and killed by her former fan club manager. And 28 years later, Selena Quintinilla is still a global sensation and icon that is celebrated and adored, especially here in South Texas. Sarah Costa takes us back to 1995 and how fans missed her then and why Selena's family believes she is still remembered and loved today. Selena Quintanilla, her music, image, and legacy still lives on today, 28 years after she was tragically shot and killed. Let's take a look back at KSET's newscast from April 1st, 1995, the day after she died. Fans and family are left with her memory and her music. Jesse Degollado visited Selena's recording studio and her hometown, where she is especially loved and missed. We can't believe this happened to someone like her. That's why we had to come here to, to make ourselves believe that she's gone. Selena gone but not forgotten. Her legacy lives on through her music, makeup line, her famous movie where Jennifer Lopez plays Selena, and right here in San Antonio where you can find several murals immortalizing the Queen of the Hanel. In 2020, her family had big plans to commemorate the 25th anniversary of her death with a concert at the Alamo Dome. Unfortunately, it was canceled due to the pandemic, but we spoke to some of her family members then. Chris Bettis, who was married to Selena when she died, told us it wasn't until several years after her death the realization he had about how big of an impact she made and is still making on people's lives. But now that people have learned the story and understand how hard it was and the work that we put into it, the work that she put into it, the work that her family put into it, and what she stands for now, I get it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I get what what she means to people and what she represents. Her sister Suzette explains it best in Selena's own words. I don't want to misquote my sister, but she said um, the goal isn't to live to it forever, but to create something that will. And I truly believe that she has done that without even realizing what she what she left behind. Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. 9, 10, 70 degrees still ahead on GMSA at 9. Our latest Solutionaries piece is centered around helping veterans deal with the emotional stress of transitioning back to civilian life. Later in the show, Stephen Cavazos is going to be back with us to talk more about the story that he worked on. But before that, a local college is opening its doors this weekend. Future students give them a closer look at their engineer program and opportunities it brings. Coming up after weather, one student shares how the program has helped him and his message to other students. 914, Friday morning. Yes, a little humid out there. I was getting used to the cool mornings, mm -hmm. and then I stepped out today. I was like, ew. We've really got a little bit of everything this week, mm -hmm. and, and next week's going to be the same. Even this weekend, we've got a front that's going to bring some variable weather. So there's a lot to talk about in the seven-day forecast. It, it's humid now. Okay. It will not be humid this afternoon. Let's first go outside, and uh, you can see the cloudy conditions. 71 degrees. Dew point is at 67. That number is high, but it will fall this afternoon because we'll see a switch in the wind. Right now, it's out of the south at about 9 miles per hour. It becomes more southwesterly during the afternoon hours. That's always a warming wind for us, but it also tends to dry us out. Uh, we'll see those temperatures really skyrocket later this afternoon. 71 right now in Hondo, 69 Kerrville, 69 Fredericksburg. There is still quite a bit of cloud cover out there. We saw some peaks of sun earlier. Clouds have since filled back in over San Antonio. But all these clouds you see out to the west, they'll start to break up. And you'll see uh, basically most of the cloud cover go away, especially west of San Antonio, probably by about lunchtime. 66, Bernie stays 70 in comfort. Right now it is 71 down there at Stenson. Dew point trend. Well, we mentioned the dew points falling off. So right now we've got dew points in the upper 60s by this afternoon and this evening. Dew points fall all the way down into the 40s and 20s. That's behind a front. Uh, and by tomorrow, it's, it's going to be fairly dry. It's just a one-day thing, though, because on Sunday, Moisture comes right back in and it's humid again. Our forecast temperature by noontime 77, still some clouds hanging on, but once the clouds go away, we're forecasting a high of 91 this afternoon and it's going to be very toasty. Uh, 92 Pleasant and 92 in Pearsall. 
warm just about anywhere you go. Uh, tomorrow, though, behind that front, uh, we'll get to temperatures about 5 to maybe 10 degrees cooler. Not much, but a little bit. A little bit helps. Uh, as we look at the big picture here, you can kind of see where our boundary is right there. It's creating some showers around Dallas. A few showers down to our south, although a lot of that's not even reaching the ground. And as we look at advisories across the state, where there's going to be some very dry air and gusty winds out west, places like Lubbock, that's where there are high wind warnings in place. Red flag advisories for uh, parts of West Texas where there's going to be a high fire threat today. And then uh, bigger picture yet here, notice everything that's going on across the country. There is a lot. We've got blizzard warnings, uh, wind advisories, all because of this storm system here that is a very dynamic. And you can see the snow there on the back side of it. So as it pushes east today, there's going to be some big time storms from Memphis to St. Louis to Chicago. And it's going to be one of those days where there's going to be a ton of severe weather, not here, but to our north and east. So again, St. Louis, Memphis, Nashville, Louisville, uh, Indianapolis. This is where there's going to be a pretty big outbreak of severe weather, potentially some tornadoes too, unfortunately. Uh, so that's what we'll be watching to our north and east where we are, though, not really getting any weather with this front. Any sort of uh, shower and storm activity along the front is going to be well to our north and east. That front pushes through by tomorrow morning, and then we get the drier air uh, moving in for one day, as I said, just uh, just during the day tomorrow. And as this front stalls to our south, there could be a storm or two along it tomorrow. And then a few showers and maybe a storm on Sunday, although rain chances are fairly low over the weekend. Uh, rain chances, though, do improve. By the end of next week, this is the good news. Uh, just a 10% chance Saturday, 20% chance Sunday. Nothing on Monday. I think Tuesday afternoon we could see a couple of storms late in the day. Wednesday, a couple showers. But rain chances on Thursday, we've bumped that up to 40%. Our best chance uh, looks like that we've had in a long, long time. So here it is laid out in the seven-day forecast. We get the front, uh, so a little cooler tomorrow, 85, lower humidity. It's 86 on Sunday, humidity is back. Uh, 93 Monday, 95 on Tuesday. That could be some record challenging heat. And we get that next front and that brings some cooler temperatures and those good rain chances we talked about by Thursday. Thank you, Justin. Local college program has allowed dozens of students to get a head start on their Texas A&M engineering degree program. It has also allowed students to save money. Tiffany Huertas joins us from Northeast Lakeview College where engineering courses are taught by Texas A&M faculty. She gives us a look at the opportunities this program is bringing students. Good morning, Tiffany. Good morning, Mark and Stephanie. Happy Friday. This campus is incredible. It's pretty recent and there's really cool programs here. Since the Texas A&M Engineering Academy program started in 2018, about 250 students have enrolled. Anna Gutierrez, program specialist with the academies, and Gunnar Howard, a student with this program, is joining us this morning. Anna, incredible program. Tell us a little bit about what it takes to be part of it. So what we look for are students who have graduated or are about to graduate high school, current college students, those who are interested in pursuing their engineering degree at Texas A&M and College Station. What do they learn in this program? So we provide the first year of classes for them where they take their calculus, their physics, everything that engineers need to take. And we also teach them the coding class. It's also taught in College Station. And the impact is big for this community. It is. We're very thankful for this program because it allows a lot of access to our students and affordability. I know here in San Antonio, we serve a lot of minority students and college sometimes the cost of college tends to almost make students not want to go. So this program helps them save almost $50,000 in two years before moving to College Station. Great opportunities. Now, Gunnar, you shared with me a little while ago about the opportunity it gave you. Tell us about that. So as an A&M student at the Engineering Academy, we're still technically A&M College Station students. So we're given the access that College Station students have. Uh, and one of those things is the SEC Engineering uh, Career Fair. and. They send us there and it's it's just an interview process. We go to different booths and I, I scored an internship with a company called Patterson UTI for the summer and it is paid, so I'm very excited about that. You're very passionate about engineering. What message do you have to maybe future students or students that might be interested in it? If you aren't passionate, choose, choose something else. <laughs> um, engineering is tough and you really have to have the passion for engineering you have to have the passion for math and science and want, wanting to figure out problems problem solving is, is is a really a big key so have that in mind awesome now anna 
the school's opening its doors this weekend. Tell us about that. So we have an open house tomorrow from 9 to 1. We're inviting all those students who are interested families. We're targeting, of course, seniors and current college students, but everyone's welcome. You'd be welcome to come to our classroom, meet our professor who will be here as well, and learn more about the academies. Awesome. And I know they kind of um, showed us the colors this morning. I don't know if it's on purpose. I don't know what happened. The universe just brought me to this color this morning. I'm very excited. Thank you to both of you for joining us. We're going to have all those details coming up on the noon show. We'll send it back to you. I would say that the universe did bring you to that yeah. color this morning, Tiffany. It all worked out. Thank you. 921, 71 degrees. Coming up next, we'll look at your morning sports, including opening day for Major League Baseball. Okay, round two, the Valero Texas Open is underway right now. Let's take a look at the um, <clears throat> leaderboard right now, and it just disappeared. There it is. All right, so Patrick Rogers at six under, Corey Connors five under, Matt Kuchar, Padraig Harrington, and MJ Daffy all at four under par right now. Other notables right now, let's take a look at some of the other ones. Uh, Jimmy Walker is at two under par. Defending champ J.J. Spawn is at one under, and we've got uh, Ricky Fowler. Also at one under par. Larry Ramirez will have updates for you on round two coming up in our later newscasts. Texas Rangers holding a moment of silence for the Nashville shooting victims before hosting the Phillies on opening day yesterday. All right, Jacob deGrom and his five-year $185 million contract got the start, and he was gone after three and two-thirds inning of an inning. After allowing six hits and five runs, he did strike out seven. Rangers come back in the fourth inning with two on. Adolis Garcia hits one to right field and off the wall. That scores two. Garcia thrown out trying to stretch a single to a double, ending over, but not before they scored nine runs. And the manager, Brian Boshi, wins his debut with the Rangers 11-7. I checked every name in this script, and I didn't check the manager. Oh, well, better luck next time, Mark. Now to the Minute Maid Park, where the world champion Astros hosted the Chicago White Sox. The World Series trophy was there, along with the 2022 championship pennant. And Houston native Megan the Stallion threw out the first pitch, which was wide left. Now to the game now. No score, bottom of the seventh. When Jordan Alvarez scores on a wild pitch, makes it one nothing. Strohs, top of the ninth. Tied at one. Two on for Andrew Vaughn, and he doubles to center. Two runs score, and the Chicago White Sox win 3-1 to spoil the party. Astros have a chance to redeem themselves today as they play the White Sox back-to-back. -back. That game is set for 7-10 tonight, and the Rangers face the Phillies again tomorrow afternoon at 3:05. Spurs start a three-game road trip tonight in California against the Warriors. Late tip set for 9 p.m. Then they play the Kings on Sunday and the Suns in Phoenix on Tuesday. Quick mention about the men's Final Four games happening tomorrow. Florida Atlantic taking on San Diego State in the first game at 5.09. And this is the University of Miami versus UConn at 7.49 p.m. The winners of those games will face each other for the national championship will be, will be played on Monday. And time now, 927 and 71 degrees for now. And let's look at what's coming up next, including a closer look at our latest solutionary story about helping veterans transition back into civilian life. How one program is helping deal with the emotional stress of that life change with the help of horses. Nine thirty-one. Welcome back. They risk their lives to protect ours, but once their mission is completed, veterans are faced with a different type of battle. The transition to civilian life can often be a difficult journey, plagued with emotional stress and isolation. However, our Stephen Cavasso saddles up and takes us to a Texas ranch where heroes are finding healing and hope, and he joins us now. Good morning. Morning Good again, morning, Stephen. Good morning, guys. All right, so Stephen, describe the technicality that went into this story. So this is a really special story. You know, we got a chance to speak with some of our nation's heroes, and uh, it took us out to a ranch in Stonewall, Texas. It's actually just uh, not that far from Blanco. And and it really, I would describe this as a labor of love because it truly was. I uh, worked with your husband, had the pleasure of working <laughs> with Luis Cinfuegos on this story. And, you know, really, it was a lot of it was dealing with multiple camera shots. I mean, he filmed so much of this on his phone. A lot of it was, uh, you know, with a typical camera that we use, but also it is working with horses. Uh, you have to have a calm energy. And when you were out there, you could see me there a little bit nervous in the beginning. That gentleman that you saw right next to me said, hey, don't be nervous because horses sense your energy. And you can clearly see that 
Yeah, I may not be an expert. I'm not a professional cowboy, but a lot of it is being present and knowing that we had a story to film and we had to work with these horses and be calm uh, made it a different process because horses, again, do sense your energy. I like this story. Well, tell us about, okay, am I saying this right? Simperfy? Yeah. Okay, Simperfy and America's Fund and the horsemanship program. So Simperfy and America's Fund was actually founded by military spouses and it actually supports all branches of the U.S. Armed Forces. And it's a really fantastic nonprofit organization because they work with critically wounded veterans, uh, their families. And a lot of it is about transitioning back into civilian life. And that could be connecting them with the right job. And oftentimes, dealing with uh, the trauma that they face when they're serving our country and many of them obviously cope with uh, different types of mental illnesses so it's connecting them to programs like this this is the jinx mccain horsemanship program and this was actually founded back in 2011 and it really serves such a great purpose it gets these veterans out and about it takes them out to big ranches out west and what they're doing is sorting cattle for ranchers so you can see it right there that gentleman that i got an opportunity the pleasure really to speak to was paralyzed from the the neck down or the waist down and uh, this was his first time getting back on a horse so it's bringing these veterans out to a ranch and it's making them uh, connect with one another and it's giving them a greater purpose as well what's the biggest challenge the organization faces Stephen? the biggest challenge mark is getting people to say yes um, you know they send the emails out they know who to reach out to but oftentimes if you or anyone you know has suffered from mental illness oftentimes you feel like you're on an island you feel isolated and it's really hard to get out of bed and so for the biggest challenge is really getting these veterans to take that first step. And that first step really starts with by saying, yes, I'm going to do this. You know, I got to watch a story. Maybe viewers at home got yeah. to watch it this week as well. Uh, it starts off very emotional. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering for you, what was your biggest takeaway from the story? I think the biggest takeaway is that, you know, there's something there with trauma that that really you do feel so alone and you do feel oftentimes that you're isolated and you feel that no one will understand you. It's like you're swimming in an ocean that and there's no land in sight. But if you really look hard enough, you're going to find people there that that share maybe similar traumas or that understand what you're going through. So the biggest takeaway is that these organizations are changing lives and they're saving lives. Uh, you know, this is giving people a greater sense of purpose. Veterans, uh, you know, these people served are really our heroes, our country's heroes. And just because they finish their battle or their mission doesn't mean that their battle is over. They are dealing with uh, new issues. And so it is connecting them to one another. It's making sure that brotherhood is still intact or sisterhood. And uh, again, it was just such a pleasure to be out there with these uh, these heroes who really did you know, serve our country. I know you've got an easy way for folks to find these yeah. stories. Yes, uh, youtube.com slash solutionaries, or you can always head over to ksat.com slash solutionaries. And we have a QR code as well. You could scan it there on your screen. I like to always talk about a different QR code. Other, you know, we <laughs> have traffic. Traffic. <laughs> traffic is important, yeah. but you know, these yeah. stories are, as, uh, are important as well. And a uh, bunch of information, also helpful resources. You know, we are Military City USA, but we know that this is also an issue so many people are facing. So a fantastic program. And you know, couldn't just, uh, again, working with Luis on this story was also great because it, was, it really was a labor of love. Well, I know really he was. enjoyed working with you and, and on this story, yeah. and y'all did a great we job. to highlight these, these heroes, so it was a great story. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so guys. much, Stephen, yeah. with our Solutionaries update. All right, let's go outside with live cam. Things are calm right now. Believe it or not, we actually had a storm in the vicinity, a storm or two in the last 24 hours, and uh, Justin has some proof. Yeah, it was last night right after sunset down there uh, near Floresville. We had a storm pop up, and it can happen in the, the kind of situation that we're in, and uh, it was very electrical isolated but beautiful with some of the shots that we're seeing coming in here to KSAC Connect. Uh, this was down in Forestville uh, and it's, it's always tough to catch lightning uh, with camera but that is that is well done. We appreciate it as always and you can submit those KSAC Connect photos by the way using the KSAT app or the KSAT weather app both of them. Uh, you can see the there's a there's a marker down at the bottom of the app where you can click on that and send in the photos. Uh, Want to get you a forecast for the Vuero Texas Open. Yesterday we had uh, some gusty winds. We're going to see that again today. A little different direction though. Southwesterly winds. It'll be up around 91. So hot for a lot of the golfers. Then we get to switch around to northeasterly wind tomorrow. Cooler, lower humidity, and then it switches around again on Sunday. So these golfers will have a challenge when it comes to the weather. Thankfully, not a, a lot of rain or thunderstorms or anything like that to slow down play. 
Uh, right now, we're still seeing cloudy skies, 71 degrees. Dew point is at 67 and southerly winds at about 9. Our case had 12 hour forecast, mostly cloudy this morning and then mostly sunny this afternoon. Those clouds will clear and that'll get our temperatures up to around 91 or so. Still pretty warm this evening before a frontal boundary works through and brings in some slightly cooler air tomorrow. Some good rain chances are showing up next week. We're going to show you that here in just a couple minutes, guys. Back to the story we'll be covering for days to come. The indictment of former President Donald Trump is under seal. ABC's Morgan Norwood is covering the story today and explains what security measures are being taken to prevent any unrest. This morning, police on high alert on the heels of Trump's indictment. What's important now is to keep an eye on certain areas which people will gather. The NYPD out in full force today with all officers ordered to report for duty in uniform at 7 a.m., preparing for potential unrest. We're not going to see this, this kind of mayhem we saw elsewhere. So these places will be really tightly monitored through aviation and rooftop uh, observation posts. We have a lot of assets out there that can help us as well as video cameras in and around lower Manhattan. So I don't think anything will, close to will happen as what happened on January 6th. Trump called for protests after claiming he was going to be arrested last week. That call to action fell flat with only a handful of demonstrators turning up at the Manhattan courthouse. And while officials say there are no credible concerns right now, the biggest concern is next week. I think the day that we're most concerned about is the day that uh, Donald Trump surrenders. During Trump's surrender, he'll be joined by Secret Service agents and could be fingerprinted and photographed, but he's unlikely to be handcuffed given the nature of the alleged crimes. He will have pictures taken and he will be fingerprinted and then brought before a judge. At that point, uh, bail or, uh, or a day, probably no bail at all, a date will be put forth for him to return. And this will be the end of it, and he'll be released. And that'll be the end of it. Morgan Norwood, ABC News, New York. 939, 71 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. When we come back, a South Side ER nurse is grateful to be alive after almost losing his life back in August after a car accident. Yesterday, he got to meet the first responders who saved his life, and we're going to share that special moment after the break. 942 in August, a Southside ER nurse found himself on the other end of a life or death situation. Jason Clark almost died in a crash, and yesterday he had the chance to meet the people that helped save his life. RJ Marquez was there as Jason reunited with those brave firefighters and paramedics. How you doing? Hello. This moment was months in the making for nurse Jason Clark and this group of San Antonio firefighters and paramedics. I'm thinking about it all the times that they came in and to my ER and uh, I didn't realize how much they're underappreciated. Jason was the passenger in a car that slammed into a barrier in early August. A witness called for help and these paramedics pulled him from the mangled car. They had to put two tourniquets on me. so to be bleeding that much if there wouldn't have been a witness. I don't think by the time they got to the scene, I would have made it. Jason was rushed to the emergency room. He lost his right arm and spent more than a month recovering in the hospital after several surgeries and injuries. Definitely no surprise that that he had the injuries that he did. It was just more extreme than, than what we normally see on a wreck. Firefighters usually don't get the opportunity to meet the people that they help save. That's why today was so important to this paramedics team and Jason. It's exciting to, to know that he's, he's doing well, he's doing okay, and that we actually made a difference in somebody's life. Jason is back at work as a nurse at Mission Trail Baptist Hospital. He's grateful for the help he's received from family and friends and for every moment he has thanks to this group of paramedics and those around him. I just wanted to say thanks to him, buy him a drink and maybe dinner, compare notes and uh, just find out what happened. Just thank him because if it weren't for them, I wouldn't be here. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. We're glad Jason's recovering and working apparently again. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Get to meet the people that yes. help save your life. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Birthday weekend for Stephanie Cerna. It is. <laughs> Yay. Lots of plans? Uh, kind of. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to get you some pretty decent weather, okay? Uh, a little You're lower. <laughs> some lower humidity tomorrow. Uh, that'll feel nice. Uh, a little more humid on Sunday, but still, still it's okay. Okay. Uh, let's go outside for you right now. It's pretty sticky at the moment. 71 degrees in San Antonio, 71 stints in 70 at Kelly and Randolph. We've got a southerly wind. Uh, at the moment at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. Now this turns southwesterly today and that's why we are forecasting some 
pretty hot temperatures this afternoon. 69 right now in Kerrville, 72 in the Braunfels, 73 Pleasanton, 73 down in Catula. And around Bear County, we're right around 70 degrees right now with uh, partly cloudy to mostly cloudy skies. Uh, the sun did try to pop out earlier. The clouds have since filled back in. But as we get into the afternoon, we'll see the clouds thin out again. And with that southwesterly wind out ahead of a front, that's why we're expecting to see temperatures like this. 91 here in town, 86 Bernie, 90 in Bandera, 91 in Pierce, all Cruz, so Springs 93. And this is hot, but we've got even warmer temperatures coming up next week. We'll show you that in just a second. Here's the satellite picture. You see all the clouds at the moment, and there are actually a few sprinkly showers here and there. Nothing that's uh, really of great consequence, but these clouds already starting to see some of those uh, the clearing line work its way into the hill country and it will work its way a little bit closer to San Antonio, probably by about lunchtime. And that's when the sun will really start to uh, pop out. As we look at the big picture here across Texas, there's the boundary right there. We've got showers and storms out ahead of it. Behind it, some very gusty winds, very dry air. So you've got high wind warnings for the panhandle, red flag warnings for West Texas, where it's very dry, gusty winds. There's a high fire threat there. And as we look at the bigger picture across the country, there are so many advisories out today because of a storm system that's spinning right about here. North of it, you got blizzard conditions, you got wind advisories, and today there's going to be an outbreak of severe weather. So here it is right now. There's the front, but as it slides east across the Midwest today, uh, Indiana down to Tennessee, there's going to be some big time storms. Storm Protection Center has this uh, in a widespread risk, meaning on a scale of one to five, about a four. So this is going to be an outbreak here, I think, from Little Rock, Memphis, Nashville, up to St. Louis. Notice, too, this extends all the way down to about Waco, but not into our area. We are on the very, very tail end of things where I don't think we see anything at all. There could be a couple storms off to our north and east. So the front moves through this evening, and by tomorrow morning, uh, the front is drifting just to the south of San Antonio. It kind of pulls up stationary, but I do think we're on the dry side of things tomorrow. And so any sort of shower or storm that develops along the front is probably going to be south of town, and we'll see some low humidity for one day because this humid humidity and warm front comes right back to the north on Sunday. We'll see a few showers Sunday morning and uh, partly cloudy conditions, humid Sunday afternoon, maybe a stray storm. Uh, and as we look at rain chances here, we'll, we'll call for a 20% chance on Sunday. But I, I think for the most part, the weekend is going to be fairly quiet. Uh, Monday's going to be a hot one. Tuesday, we could see some afternoon storm chances. And then Wednesday, some small chances. It's Thursday where we're looking at some pretty good rain chances at this point. Right now we have 40%. That could go up. Uh, it's looking promising. 85 tomorrow, 86 on Sunday, but more humidity, 93 Monday, 95 on Tuesday. There are those hot temperatures I was talking about. And then our next front does cool us down for Wednesday and Thursday, guys. Thank you, sir. Fiesta just a few weeks away. And here at KSAT, we're gearing up for a month of fun, and you have a chance to be a part of it. RJ Marcus and Mia Montgomery are out at Legacy Park right now for our Be a Royal KSAT Insider Contest. And RJ, Mia, tell us more about what's going on today. All right, guys, we are getting ready for to make a huge announcement here when it comes to Fiesta. And you see, we already have the crowns. And don't they remind we, you of something? Do we look like anything familiar, maybe, here in San Antonio <laughs> on the skyline? The yeah, Frost Bank I think we do. I think we do. Yeah, so this is all part of a big insider contest that we're having. Mia, kind of explain a little bit of what people can expect. Yeah, exactly. So KSAT Insider is our membership program here at KSAT 12. And for Fiesta, we have an amazing sweepstakes contest that we are putting on here here, essentially, KSAT insiders can enter into this contest, and the winner, along with three guests, will not only be able to get decked out, mm -hmm. king's robes, and crowns, but you'll be able to ride yeah. in the Battle of Flowers Parade on a private float. All right, so yeah, coming up on KSAT News Now at 11 a.m., we're going to be talking to some individuals with the Battle of Flowers Association to let you know about more about this contest. It is really exciting. You guys mentioned Fiesta now less than, what, a month away at least? And Coming yeah, up. we are getting really excited about this event. So check out KSAT News Now today at 11 a.m. on KSAT.com. Mark and Stephanie? Thanks. Guys, I, I just watched your entire live shot and realized the crowns you were wearing were the Frost Tower. <laughs> <laughs> they look perfect. You yeah, standing Fiesta in ready. front of the Frost Tower, yeah. Okay. There yes. you go. There we go. All right. RJ and Mia, thank you guys. See you guys at 11 Align, about 950, 71 degrees.
and it's General Hospital's 60th anniversary coming up next. We're going to tell you how the longest running daytime drama is celebrating. It is the longest running daytime drama in the history of American TV, and it's not GMSA. General Hospital celebrating its 60th anniversary with a series of episodes that play like a tribute and a reunion. ABC's Sandy Kenyon explains how the show has made a positive impact on loyal viewers and a new generation of performers ensures the show will remain popular for many years to come. How long have you worked at GH? 45 years. But the hospital's turning 60 this year. Amid the milestone, there are so many memories. To be here at 60, toasting 60, I feel very proud. <laughs> and so many of us can remember when Luke married Laura while 30 million Americans watched. Just one high point in a history that began in black and white. Family is what's kept it going this long, which in turn gives it the loyalty of the audience who thinks General Hospital's family. A glance at the cast assembled for a special anniversary photo shoot indicates the diversity of the families assembled by executive producer Frank Valentini. I think the writers and Frank do a really incredible job of balancing the legends of the show and the history with them with this kind of younger cast that they're building. The nurse's ball is back after a hiatus due to the pandemic. I think this is a great way to celebrate the 60th. We get to see everybody in such beautiful glam clothes and everybody gets to show their talent and entertain. Chandra Wilson is a longtime fan of GH and so was the late movie star Elizabeth Taylor who appeared on the show in 1981. Quiet! Just one year later, future stars Brian Cranston and Demi Moore checked into General Hospital. Robert, this is Harlan Baker. Good to meet you. The chance to appear where so many others have was one of the highlights of my career. That makes witnessing history now all the more meaningful. Happy 60th anniversary, General Sandy Kenyon, ABC News, New York. A United of San Antonio and Barrett County are finding ways to support parents who are looking for higher education and job training by providing scholarships. Coming up on Monday on GMSN, Timothy, Tiffany Huerta speaks with a local mom who says their scholarship has not only helped her, but her family as well. Still sticky out there. We're in the low 70s, but the clouds clear. Humidity drops off a little bit today, and it turns into a hot day. 91 for your Friday. Nice evening tonight as front comes through, but this is kind of a weak front. Cools us down a little bit, gives us some more humidity tomorrow. Small chance of a shower, maybe a storm Saturday into Sunday. Otherwise, hot to start next week. And here's the best part. I think we've got some good rain chances coming our way by the end of next week. Be That's nice good. for April Fool's tomorrow because it's Stephanie Serna's birthday Aww. tomorrow. We're not kidding about that at all. <laughs> no, not Happy, birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Bye, guys. Have a good weekend.